Is music a civilizing force? The first major philosopher to ask that question was Plato, and his answer was that it depends. Some music civilizes, but some music barbarizes. Plato opposed the dance music of his day, which employed scales and rhythms that, in his view, aroused what is darkest and least controllable in the human psyche. Sedate music in the Dorian mode met with his approval. You can march to it, even conceivably dance to it, and it would impart discipline and virtue to the soul. But wild music in the Mixolydian mode was, Plato believed, a source of corruption, producing in young people traits of character that no civilized republic should allow. We don't know much about the music that Plato was discussing, but we surely know why he was discussing it. We are shaped by our musical tastes, which can impact directly on our social behaviour. It really matters what the young are hearing, and especially what they are dancing to. As Plato provocatively expressed the point, the ways of poetry and music are not changed anywhere without change in the most important laws of the city. So beware of those rabble-rousing disc jockeys and music in which there is nothing but a beat. We make a distinction that Plato did not clearly make between serious music and the rest, where the rest includes most music that young people dance to. Serious music is music that you listen to in silence, maybe in special surroundings like a church or a concert hall. Performers of serious music dress in formal clothes and sit in tight postures before audiences who attend or should attend to every note that they hear. And when we make serious music together, as in a string quartet or a leader recital, our feelings as performers are synchronized and the harmony of the music becomes a harmony of souls. This very special relation between people binds them in a way that has been one of the most important sources of mutual understanding in our civilization. I have distinguished serious from non-serious music, and many will object to this distinction, dismissing it as elitist or exclusive, and suggesting perhaps that there is no civilizing privilege that attaches to my kind of music as opposed to anyone else's. I don't intend to reply to that objection, since those who make it are, in my experience, immune to argument, and life is too short in any case. Instead, I shall treat you to a fragment of autobiography. I knew little music as a child, despite singing in the choir of our local church until my voice broke. The reason for this was that music was never played in our household, never listened to, and never seriously discussed. I might have been an ordinary suburban ruffian, jerked into animation from time to time by Adam Faith or Buddy Holly, and with an ability to hit the right notes in the descant to our hymns, but otherwise with no place in my soul for real music. Then, on the death of our grandmother, a piano came to the house, and I, aged thirteen, was granted a vision of another way of being— after giving a timid bow, our mother, who had never revealed the slightest trait of musical talent, sat down and began to play. She remembered only two things from her childhood repertoire, Billy Mayle's Marigold and the slow movement of Beethoven's Pathétique Sonata. In the emotional exaltation that immediately followed, nothing was more vivid to me than the difference between those two pieces of music— the one sociable, catchy, flirtatious, and trivial, the other, and there was no better word for it, profound. Something spoke from the Beethoven for which I had no words, and with which I was entirely unfamiliar. Beethoven's melody was for the first time opening a door for me onto emotional and spiritual possibilities that seemed infinitely more valuable than anything I had yet experienced. From that moment on, I had a new aim in life, which was to know, and if possible to play, music of that kind, music that commanded total silence from the listener and total involvement from the performer. I saved up to buy a gramophone and began to spend my pocket money on long-playing records. I successfully begged for piano lessons. 
I discovered the third program on the wireless and was amazed by what I heard. Not just concerts of serious music, but people who spoke about it and who unashamedly and without troubling to discuss the matter revealed their immovable belief that serious music is different in kind from the pop music of the day. I discovered that you could discuss serious music endlessly, arguing the merits of one piece over another and associating each piece with thoughts, emotions and attitudes that had the widest possible implication for the moral health of humankind. It seemed absolutely right to describe the first subject of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony as expressing both fortitude and also, in its magical change of key, an apprehension of the long-term difficulties that fortitude must face. It was obvious that the second subject invites the listener into a realm of peace and tenderness, the other side of courage, and also its domestic reward. Of course, these descriptions were metaphors, but they made connections that I also felt as an adolescent who was just beginning to enter the adult world and to recognise that emotions really matter and stand to be judged. Feelings can be barbarous, crude and belligerent. They can also be refined, sensitive and kind. I might never have learned this from my fellow ruffians at school, but I learned it without a shadow of hesitation from music, from Beethoven first of all, and then from Bach. Let me linger over Bach if only to record that he did for me what he has done for every musical person I have ever known, which is to display music as a universal language in which every variety of movement and feeling can be expressed and also reconciled. Bach's unutterable mastery of melody, harmony and counterpoint, leading to music in which every line is as interesting, as autonomous and as governed by its own emotional identity as every other, does not only set an ideal for music, it sets an ideal for life. Polyphony has a good claim to be both an invention of our Western musical tradition and also one of the achievements of which our civilization should be most proud. Bach mapped out this terrain completely, showing the way in which freedom and necessity are reconciled. In Bach's contrapuntal writing, simultaneous voices journey side by side through musical space, clashing, resolving, quarrelling and reconciling in a model of law-governed dialogue. And when, in a work like the St. Matthew Passion, Bach uses this absolute mastery of musical space to present the deepest of religious mysteries, we are moved to tears. Those tears are real tears, they come because we are being led by the music into the very heart of the human condition. Bach's godlike perspective over musical space shows the tragedy that is inherent in all that happens to us and the consolation through which we can understand and accept it. As I grew into music, I was aware that my musical education was not about music alone. It was an education of my whole social being acquainting me with states of mind that I could not otherwise have easily grasped. Consider those six hundred songs that Schubert bestowed on us in his regrettably so short life. Would I know from within all the exquisite pains and promises of love, the dark solitude of rejection, the breeze-born longings and blithe cheerfulness to which I constantly refer when reminding myself of the variety and beauty of the human condition, had it not been for Schubert? Of course not. He underlined those German romantic poems with incomparable music and thereby carried them straight to the heart. Of course he had the benefit of words, but words that have imprinted themselves on the soul of every musical person because the music has translated them into a language yet more potent than the one in which they were written. Perhaps the greatest gift that I obtained then from serious music was the discovery of the early modernists and the way in which they took hold of my ruffian nature and both reconciled me to it and shook me free of it. Playing truant one afternoon, my friend and I hitchhiked to London and managed to wangle our way into the old Sadler's Wells. 
two wonderful masterworks were being performed, Stravinsky's Oedipus Rex and Bartok's Bluebeard's Castle. We came home by train in total silence. The cold objectivity of the Stravinsky and the dark inwardness of the Bartok acquainted two adolescent boys on the verge of life with the deepest of warnings as to what awaited us. Not just the danger, but the objective necessity of love, power and entanglement. And all this conveyed by melodies and chords that defied the rules of classical harmony, and which told us at every instant that the world is after all a difficult and alien place, and that in the things that most deeply concern us, we are alone. One feature of our musical tradition stands out as worthy of mention, if only because it is so rarely discussed by the experts. This thing is silence. Everywhere around us today we encounter the abuse of music. In restaurants, bars, public spaces, shops and even railway stations, the same idiot noise is stuffed into the cracks where silence should be. The place to experience silence is the concert hall. I do not refer to the silence between movements, which is, after all, a shuffling kind of silence, full of coughs and stretches. I mean the silence that is there while the music is playing, the intense listening silence that can only exist when people gathered together are governed by a shared attentiveness. In front of every orchestra there gathers an extraordinary pool of quiet, across which the music ripples like moonlight across a lake. This is one of the most moving aspects of the promenade concerts, the broadcasting of which is that rare thing, an argument for the existence of the BBC. Wherever you are in the kingdom, you can turn on the radio during those crucial months and listen to the silence of 5,000 people. And it is precisely this silence that inspires the greatest musical performances. No studio recording can match it. For the real performance of serious music is one half of a dialogue, the other half of which is a deep stillness, the stillness of people brought together by listening. All that said, why do I conclude that serious music has been, in my life at least, a civilising influence? And if it has been, is that not just a peculiar fact about me rather than a fact about music? Think of those great lovers of serious music, Stalin and Hitler. Think of those prison camp commandants who listened with intense emotion as the men and women they were about to send to the gas chambers performed their last string quartet. Is that not proof that the love of serious music is as compatible with barbarism as with civilization? Those questions are serious, and I have no final answer to them. Neither religion, nor morality, nor love has proved able to overcome the hatred that wells up between people once threats are issued and anger prevails. Yet religion, morality, and love are civilizing forces. Without them, anger has no real opponent, and barbarism will quickly seize the advantage. Music stands with religion, morality, and love in this encounter. It is one part of the network of sympathy and forgiveness whereby civilizations rise and prosper. Take it away or replace it with belligerent and repetitious nonsense, and you threaten the order on which society depends, which is an order in the soul. So Plato argued, and Plato was right. <laughs>